Tom McDonald, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Uh, it was a big day for Labour yesterday, a massive um, uh, sort of uh, plan outlaid there before the public of Bre Great Britain. Uh, it's been pretty well received in some quarters. Other people are saying you haven't got the money to do it. Uh, Office of Fiscal Studies saying they've worked out that you have to raise more VAT or you have to raise more income tax if you really want to make all of this work. What would you say to them? I have a lot of time for the IFS and I've worked with them over the years on this one, I think they've just got it wrong because I don't think they've looked at the, the manifesto in total. What we're saying, let's be absolutely clear, um, we do need to spend more. And it is big because the challenges are big and because we've had 10 years of austerity. And we cannot, we cannot allow the housing crisis to go on. We cannot allow our schools to be literally schools begging for funds for basics. And we cannot allow our NHS to be in this crisis. We've got to fund it properly. And the way to do it, we're saying very, very clearly, we are increasing income tax. We're increasing income tax on the top 5% of the earners. We're saying 95% of people will not have their income tax rates increase or VAT or national insurance. But we are saying to corporations, you've had large tax cuts over the last 10 years. You haven't invested in the way you should we're reversing some of those tax cuts. You'll still be competitive internationally, but we're reversing some of those. We're also saying to the City of London, we need you to pay a little bit. We need you to contribute a bit more now. And we're saying to, yes, yeah, some of the rich and corporations who we don't think are paying their taxes, uh, they're avoiding and evading sometimes their taxes, we're going to clamp down on tax evasion and tax avoidance. In that way, we will be able to fund the public services that we need. Now, the IFS has said, well, companies will simply put up prices or cut wages. No, they won't, because we're restructuring our economy. So on those company boards, a third of their board will be workers. There'll be supervisory boards, which consumers are represented on as well. So we will not have this system whereby they keep on passing on the cost to their customers or their workers, whilst at the same time, they're making quite well, massive profits. You know, they had tax cuts of over... 100 billion under the Tories and that hasn't been invested in our economy. How will you make them do that though? Because that's a question a lot of people have been asking me. You know, you've used the word required before uh, when we spoke the other day. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn has also used that word. How would you get companies uh, to actually do something that they may not wish to do? Because we're restructuring the boards. We're making sure workers and consumers are represented. That's yeah, but how though? So but how do you restructure the board of a company which is not publicly owned? Oh, well, simply you introduce legislation. It's as simple as that. It happens, it happens in Europe and elsewhere. You introduce legislation. You enable that to happen. And this is commonplace in other countries. In fact, it's interesting, isn't it? When we were assisting Germany after the Second World War to be reconstructed, we put in place a lot of the, on our advice, a lot of the legislation that enabled the democratisation of their economy much more effectively. And that's what we want to do here. And on the public utilities that we're bringing back into public ownership and control, basically on rail, on water, on energy, on Royal Mail, what we're, what we're doing is, is we're making sure that they're properly managed no longer used for speculation, but on their boards will be expert management, representatives of workers and representatives of communities and representatives of consumers and passengers. On that basis, you stabilise the future of those companies. They're no longer driven by short-term profiteering and sharehold only shareholder value. And, you know, this reform, this debate isn't just happening here. It's happening in the United States of America at the moment, as well as across Europe. And what about this uh, transition fund, the windfall tax that you want to put on oil and gas companies? How wide-ranging would that be? And when did you change your mind on that? Because you said previously that wasn't going to happen. Oh, what I didn't. What happened, I was given a question by the Daily Telegraph early in the week about um, there'd been a leak from our manifesto and how was this going to operate. And I said I wouldn't tell him how it was going to operate. I said, no, 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 because I wasn't going to give away our manifesto two days before. Well, unlike Boris Johnson. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, leave, I'll leave others to comment on that. Um, but look, what we've said, uh, we'll work with the companies themselves and independent experts. All we're saying is this, is that the North sea, in North Sea Oil, the UK-based companies have made quite a large amount of money over the years, but now we're moving from fossil fuel and to alternative energy. So we want now to undertake an assessment of what that will cost 
Um, one of the figures that's been put up is at least $11 billion to enable the workers who are now, well, will be displaced from their jobs to be retrained with the skills that we need to ensure that we have the alternative energy sources. And the jobs that will be created by our, what we call the Green Industrial Revolution, all, all of that about developing wind and wave and solar power, insulating people's homes, all of that will require a skilled workforce. Those skills are out there amongst those people who have been associated with the oil and gas industry who are now unfortunately losing their jobs because of that, that they will move on now to being part of that green industrial revolution. The opportunity is enormous. And we feel the oil companies who've made so much profit from North Sea oil actually then should assist us in that just transition. That's why we're saying they should make a contribution to protect those workers and those communities that up until now have been dependent on oil and gas industries help us now shift that into the green industrial revolution, the green industries that we need. Let's talk a little bit about Brexit. I presume you guys have now got a team working on negotiations that would take place as soon as uh, an election result happens. If you do win the election, you'll need to go and start uh, negotiating a new deal. What uh, what parts of Boris Johnson's new deal would you change uh, and how would you make it a better deal for Britain? Well, remember, we've had a team working on this for the last couple of years and we were... Can you remember, we were in six weeks of negotiations with Theresa May's cabinet going through what we thought was a, a realistic deal. But we, at the same time, of course, we were talking to um, European partners as well about that. And we said, basically, we do need a permanent customs union. We, it's the one way of making sure we protect our trade, but also overcoming this problem with regard to the Good Friday Agreement. We mustn't do anything that in any way endangers the Good Friday Agreement and the potential of long-term peace in Northern Ireland and Ireland overall. The current permanent customs union is exactly what we're saying, but we're saying that customs union relationship needs to be partially redesigned so we have much greater say about future trade deals in Europe. Second thing, yes, a close market relationship with a single market, but also this issue about dynamic relationship with regard to regulations of workers, environment and consumer rights. We mustn't be in a situation where there's, if Boris Johnson gets his way, got his way, would be the undermining of those basic regulations. And amongst that as well, I have to say, we don't want to be in a situation where we have a Tory government that is already involved in negotiations with Donald Trump about an American trade deal that would sell out our NHS. Why do you keep saying that when you know it's not true? Because every, every, Labour, there, every Labour politician mentions Donald Trump as if he's running against you. Well, the evidence is there. Go to the dispatches program. Go to the documents that they released that have been heavily redacted between the meetings between negotiators here and the, well, the big pharma companies in America. You know what they're about. What yeah, they're, they're about, about selling open, pharmaceuticals open. To, to, to the NHS, aren't they? Yes, but that's the foot in the door. Don't you see that? Well, they're that's the only the people the that door. make those pharmaceuticals, so they sell them to the NHS, and that's where we go to buy them, surely? Well, well, we're not in a situation where we have to be dependent upon them. We'll rip off prices, and what they're trying to do, that's the foot in the door, the, the stage in which then they can start squeezing the NHS. And you know what will follow after that is further privatisation. We cannot allow... We cannot allow our NHS to be undermined in that way. Finally, John, and I appreciate your time this morning, um, Angela Rayner says that even she acknowledges that Jeremy Corbyn is not a particularly popular leader for the Labour Party. Do you think they'd be doing better or you'd be doing better in the polls if you were in charge? No, not at all. The, Jeremy is exactly the sort of leader we want. And you know what's interesting, isn't it? Jeremy's had a battering from some of the well, written media, in particular the press, because... It's owned by people whose power and wealth we're challenging. With some of these press owners, we'll say, you're going to pay your taxes. So of course they don't like us. And of course they'll pillory J Jeremy Corbyn. And he's had a bat in day after day after day. And then what happens in elections? Broadcast media, legally obliged to give us a semblance of balance. People see the real Jeremy Corbyn, as they did on the debate the other night. And look at the figures on the don't knows in that debate vast majority of don't knows actually back Jeremy Corbyn. So people actually making up their minds see the real Jeremy Corbyn, the principled, strong leader that he is, but the sort of leader we need now, someone who can listen, bring people together, build consensus, unite the country again. That's exactly the leader we want. And I think as we go into this campaign, 
you'll see more and more people recognise that. There were a few people heckling you in Birmingham yesterday because the uh, the day that you chose to launch the manifesto, unfortunately, was the 45th anniversary of the Birmingham pub bombings. Uh, quite, a, quite a few angry people calling him IRA scum, which I wouldn't support at all. Um, what was his reaction to that? Well, it's, it's, we didn't shy away from that date at all. We knew the date itself. Um, actually, Jeremy wanted to make a statement about that, which, which he did, and which was about sadness and for all those who suffered and about the need for justice as well. And so on all of those on all of those issues, Jeremy's always promoted peace, always tried to bring people together to secure consensus and secure peace. And that's what I respect about the man. No matter how how much flack he gets, he always does what he believes to be the right thing. And the right thing for him is to always reject violence and always seek peace. John McDonald, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.